Thank you very much, Melanie, for this uh, very generous uh, and gentle reminder of my age. Uh, I'm very glad to be with three, well, you are many around in this room, but three extraordinary, three extraordinary strong women. Nancy, thank you very much for having the blue color on the U.S. History piece. It's no coincidence my choice of color for my tie today. Uh, and everything you have done, uh, both out in the field, in the NGO community, and uh, in USAID, and now as head of uh, this wonderful organization. Uh, so, um, and then uh, Melanie, uh, great friend, but also a great colleague in developing ideas of prevention in particular, and peace building. And over the years, in different roles, we have worked together, and uh, I'm sure we will continue to work together. And it's great to be with you. And Kristina Georgieva, a friend uh, since uh, some time when the humanitarian crisis were, which they still are, <clears throat> enormously difficult to deal with. We had this fantastic ally in the European Union when you were commissioner for humanitarian affairs. And we're glad that you now are in charge of uh, the financial portfolio, uh, the vice president of that portfolio. Uh, you know, you better be careful. The finance sector, you better have the friends in that area. And we're glad to have you there. So these three women, great leaders, probably are a sign of times, aren't they? We will see in the next few years or so uh, where we will see women leaders take over in different parts of the world, and international organizations also, perhaps. You know, there is a movement in a certain direction in my own organization. But I will not enter that sensitive uh, subject now. <clears throat> I wondered whether I should begin on the uh, dark side or the, the light side, the positive side. I say often that in the United Nations, we are working in two perspectives. In fact, we are reflecting, we are a mirror of two things. We are a mirror of the world as it is. And it's not a pretty place. But we are also a mirror reflection of the world as it should be. And I think our job is to reduce the gap between the world as it is and the world as it should be. And I expect from my colleagues to not put on rosy glasses when it comes to the world as it is. They should be very tough in their analysis, no illusions. But then they should, we should never forget what the world should be. So, I, even to this second, I have decided whether I would start on the positive or negative. Any vote in favor? <laughs> Okay, I start with the positive. I always carry the UN Charter in the pocket. I've had it here since 1984. This is my 12th version. And I think I will make it easy for myself because I will read to you the preamble. To me, this is diplomatic poetry. It is what this is all about. And miraculously, these fantastic founders of this organization knew already that you have to combine peace and security with development, with human rights and the rule of law. In the preamble, they have the model already written. Now, listen. And by the way, there is no coincidence that the first three words are we the peoples. We talk about accountability, in my view, the accountability is vis-a-vis -vis people. Can they have peace, development, human rights, rule of law? Anyway, this is how it is. And you probably know it. If not, I can send you copies. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca, are you here? We'll make sure that you get copies. You you, we just printed up a new, huge edition of Georgia's 70th anniversary. <clears throat> we, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, 
in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small. Three, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligation arrive, arri arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, rule of law. And fourth, to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. You got all four elements here. The same formula that I, as President of the General Assembly, had the great honor to gavel on the 16th of September 2005, when we stated with the full support of all member states, and we remind them every day, practically, that there is no peace without development, there is no development without peace, and there is none of the above without respect of human rights and the rule of law. Three pillars on which the work of the United Nations and of work, in my view, of any society rest. If one of these pillars is weak, the other pillars are weak. There is no sequential analysis around this, that first you do peace and then you do development and then you do human rights. There was a theory about that in the 70s, believe it or not. No. You have to do it at the same time. Because if we don't do that, the structure is weak. The three pillars have to be maintained and equally considered equally important. Now, of course, I have to paint that negative picture also. Because to live up to this is not easy. I think we are facing huge problems. Uh, I've been around for in diplomacy as you understood from Melanie's introduction, for a long time. <laughs> and I, I must admit that I have not found more of uncertainty in the world than it is today, the directions we are going. And I think we are faced with a huge challenge to prove that institutions can work, can succeed. Not only international institutions like United Nations and European Union, but also national institutions. Because if there is a lack of belief in institutions, in the democratic institutions in particular, and we don't deliver peace, development, and human rights, where do people go in frustration? They go to find identity rather in a religious sect or a national identity or local identity, and then they divide with the help of extremist groups, humanity into us and them and there is a competition of brutality going on to bring in fear in societies, to divide us even more. So we have a tremendous task now to increase credibility of strength of both national and international institutions. In the three pillars, I can only mention the main challenges because I think I want to focus at the end on the SDGs, in particular SDG 16. But the, in the first pillar, first area, it is, of course, the war in Syria, which is like an infected wound. There is another infected wound that Nancy just told about. We've had a conversation before on Israel-Palestine, of course. But the presently most dramatic situation is around Syria, where you ask yourself, what else does it take to come to the conclusion that this war has to be ended? Isn't it enough with seeing a quarter of a billion people being killed? Countries like Lebanon having every third inhabitant being a, a, a refugee. ISIS, Daesh taking over territory in Syria or here and in Iraq. And refugees fleeing into Europe, destabilizing. And I'm sure Kriselina have a few words to say about that, at least in discussion later on. Countries and dividing countries in Europe to a very dangerous degree. And possibly now having financing for these huge operations taken from the development budget, which would mean a blow to the development system in the United Nations, but also on the life in the ground on the, in the developing countries. What else does it take to come to that conclusion? Fortunately, last week, there was progress. I can't say no more, but at least we have the main actors around the table, including Russia and US, but also, as you saw, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I just come back from a trip to those two countries, by the way. On development, I say human rights first because I would want to end on development. Human rights, I think, is uh, 
we have to sort of introduce a culture of human rights in the United Nations, but also in our societies. I feel that there is a need today to have a bit of a renaissance of the knowledge of international law. When in the Security Council there was a negotiation on access, humanitarian access in Syria, I as a former humanitarian uh, coordinator in the UN found it extraordinary that they were actually negotiating elements that were part of humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions. And I find that the Refugee Convention of 1951 is not known to those who now discuss the refugee issues. And this charter, I could go on with the different chapters of this charter, particularly chapter six, Peaceful Settlement Disputes, or as it states more, more poetically, Pacific Settlement Disputes. How much do we do with that? In other words, we should show respect for what our predecessors in politics and diplomacy have achieved and be reminded of this, because we have this neglect and lack of knowledge, and even, as I said, competition of brutality as a sort of systematic way of spreading fear. We better be reminded of what we as a humanity have agreed after this horrible war. So we also have introduced something, and I'm very proud to be leading that on behalf of Secretary Ellen Ban Ki-moon, and that is the Human Rights Upfront Initiative which is meant to say that human rights are not only important in itself to be that third pillar, but it's also why don't we, instead of waking up to a crisis in the humanitarian crisis stage or the uh, peacekeeping stage when houses are burning and people are dying, why don't we instead act on the human rights violations? Because the human rights violation is the first vibrations in the ground that things will go wrong. But that is often by countries considered interference in internal affairs, even if they know that they, this might end up in civil war or even regional wars. But we are pushing this ahead now. We hope we will get the support of member states to move in that direction and give warning about things that can go wrong. This is, to me, the life of a conflict. It's a very long distance between my two hands. But sometimes we tend to CNN, even Security Council tend to define the crisis here, forgetting there is a pre-side pre prevention and there is a post-side. If we start to understand that the life of conflict is this long and that we have an obligation to act both in the pre and post, then we make qualitative process, progress. Finally, to the last point, development. And I think the best news in this dark world that we after all these realities we are faced with in Syria and the wars in Africa and inequalities and violations of human rights uh, and terrorism uh, in combination with organized crime etc etc we I found it personally absolutely wonderful to after three and a half years of work on this negotiation process see on the 26th of September this agreement on the sustainable development goals in the, not in the presses, but preceded by a wonderful speech by His Holiness the Pope, Pope Francis. I think I went to bed with a smile that evening. <laughs> I felt so good that, oh, we did it. We were, haunt, haunt, we were hounded by the media that these, media, these goals are far too many, you know, and they are too complex. But I say the, the world is complex, and we need to move to a new transformative stage of development. It's not the donor co community vis-a-vis -vis the recipients. It's a new world where development is, as Melanie says, universal. It's all of us. It's sustainability. It is a transformative change forward. We bring in elements of these goals that give a much richer, in my view, much more realistic uh, view of what development will be like, namely bring in aspects like uh, technology transfer, uh, the uh, migration issues, the uh, urbanization issues, uh, industrialization, uh, and all these elements that are in there. And they force the UN system in a positive way, which I'm really waiting for, to work together. Because these goals belong together, can be seen together. If you see them in the ed education cluster or the health cluster, or if it's in an area which I'm very interested in, water, you see that we, if you do water and sanitation right, you get good effects on child mortality, maternal health, uh, education, gender equality, and poverty. In the present MDGs, five other goals are affected. So we, with the new goals, will bring about a more holistic, integrated approach. And 
Apart from the sustainability dimension that goes all, through all the, the goals, SDGs, the goal 16 has exactly that quality. That is on the importance of peaceful societies, which is the peace and security dimension. It is the access to justice and the inclusive, transparent institutions in the human rights dimensions, you, they connect to the model. So at Goal 16 will bring in this integrated approach. And it is a very important aspect of getting the goals into reality. I must tell you that unfortunately this was pretty controversial. In the negotiations this was perhaps the most difficult of the goals to come to an agreement on. The word rule of law is not as part of the target. It is only as a, as a, it's, it's not a goal, it's a target, and a, it's lower down. It, maybe it could, should have been re in reverse. I will end with a personal example why that goal is so important. Sweden was, my, my country Sweden, was one of Europe's poorest countries in the 1920s. It was, Sweden, Norway and Finland were down on the list and conditions in my country particularly in winters, were incredible. My aunt died in tuberculosis out of starvation, more or less. You couldn't believe that when you look at me, perhaps. I grew up in one room. I saw my first bathroom in life at age 10. Uh, none in my family had more than 70 years of education, ever, in the history of my family, both on my mother's and father's side. My father was a labor union leader, and at age 18, when I graduated from high school, as the first one in family ever, I asked my father, what do you think was the reason why Sweden turned into this prosperous, well-functioning society as we were at the time? And he said in his words, which I now paraphrase, he didn't use the words that I use now, but he said approximately the following, three, three things, my son. First, in the 30s we developed infrastructure. We loaned money to build railroads and roads, hospitals and schools, which later became this a well-functioning public sector. And it gave jobs. I, as a metal worker, could get jobs in the 30s after the depression. depression. And then, through the political changes in my country, in our country, education was given the absolute highest priority, so that every boy and girl could have a free education from grade one to university without paying one krona. And we put a lot of money into that system. And you, pointed to me, are the first one in our family to ever profit from that. And then thirdly, to come to the point on SDG 16, he said we had strong institutions, strong and honest institutions. We put our best people in the city administration, we put our friends in the, in the state administrations and the government, they, damn it, they had to be really doing a good job. We were hounding them and they were doing a good job. They did produce what we wanted. And he told me in the 50s, Two elections were won by the party that promised higher taxes. They promised higher taxes, and they won the election. This doesn't exist today. <laughs> <laughs> but I just say to my friends in Africa, Asia, Latin America, when I tell my story, listen, if you don't have institutions, you don't have continuity of effort, you need to make sure that it is being built into your system, in your legal system, in your political system. So this is my introduction, far too long perhaps, but it was great to be here with you, it is great to be with you, and I look forward now to, I think it's Nancy who is introducing Kristalina, but great to see a full house uh, discussing this very important subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for that wonderful and, and, and inspiring uh, recollection of the UN Charter. Um, and for those who are interested, there, USIP actually published a book on your mediation style that uh, if for those who are interested in the success uh, uh, that characterizes your approach. Um, I am it, it, I'm so happy to be able to welcome and introduce um, a, a good friend and colleague um, who is an exceptional leader. Um, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, who is currently the European Commission Vice President of Budget and Human Resources, where you oversee an enormous team, 3,300, 33,000 staff members, um, 
33,000 staff members uh, and, a, and the budget of the European Union, which is extraordinary. I know Kristalina from her years as uh, the, European, uh, the European Union's Commissioner on Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Response, where I, can t I spent a lot of time with Kristalina in uh, official meetings where everybody had placards and was speaking in diplomatic terms until you got to Kristalina, where she shook up the room with passion, with energy, and reminded all of us what were, what were we there to do. Um, and because of that combination of, of her financial acumen, her leadership qualities, and her humanitarian um, passion and experience, she was asked by uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to serve as the chair of a, of a panel on, a high-level panel on humanitarian financing. And she has brought all those strands together with the usual extraordinary competence and uh, vision that we expect of you. So please join me in welcoming uh, Kristalina Georgieva. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, it is uh, a huge honor to speak after the Deputy Secretary General here, uh, who has uh, done in his life so much for the world and for us in Europe, not only in his own uh, country. Uh, and um, I would pick it up from uh, him by looking at the world that we live in first with a positive eye. Hey, it's a wonderful world. Uh, it is uh, very wealthy for most people. $75 trillion economy of this planet. It has achieved, especially in the last decades, enormous advancements in technology, innovation, quality of life. Medicine today makes it already possible for us to live until we are 120 years of age, which sounds wonderful until we re realize that you have to work until you are 100 years old <laughs> for your pension, but that's on the side. Um, I had a very um, wonderful experience with my granddaughter telling her how life used to be. I said to her, when I was your age, we didn't have television and we didn't uh, have computers. So she looks at me and says, so you only had iPads. <laughs> and it makes you realize, that comment made, you real, made me realize that the world has changed for so many things for the better. But it is also a more fragile world. Because of climate change, because of violent extremism, because of population growth in areas of this world that can least afford to take care of people, what we face is also exponential increase of children, women and men who depend on, our, on others, on, on our goodwill, on the United Nations capabilities for their very survival. And these are the people who have least access to the high corridors of power. If they were a country with a population of 120 million, they would have been the 11th largest country in the world, just between Japan and Mexico. And in this country, half of the population, as Nancy said in the beginning, would be homeless. They would be displaced for no fault of their own. Most of the adults in this country would have no jobs. 
to sustain their families. They would depend on handouts. And majority of the children, and especially girls, would be out of school. No hope for the future. People living in fear. And I would like to talk about what is our obligation to the population of this country. Our first obligation is in a world so rich to spare the money for lives to be saved. No one, no one should die or have their dignity destroyed just because of lack of money. Last year, the world was generous more than ever to the people in this country. We have spent collectively registered in the UN uh, tracking system $25 billion. Just by comparison, in year 2000, we spent $2 billion. 12 times jump of funds. But also, never before has our generosity been so insufficient. The gap between needs and funding has never been so great. If you take a very simple measure of survival, which is one dollar per person per day, we are about 15 billion short. And of course we can say, oh, 15 billion is a lot of money. Is it really? So our panel is charged with the task to come with very concrete suggestions of how we can close the gap. And we are leaving no stone unturned for that purpose. We look at what private sector can do. It is the least tapped resource today mostly because we think of private sector as charity and we don't think of how to capture the skills and capabilities, the innovation, the problem solving, the logistics that private sector can deliver on a larger scale. We look at the Islamic uh, financing. Um, almost 90% of people who suffer because of conflicts live in Muslim uh, societies. And yet we have not been able, and yet 75% of money that is raised comes from the so-called traditional uh, donors, from the European Union, from the United States, Australia, Japan, uh, Canada. So the question is how to make Islamic financing a more systematic source. Uh, those, how many of you are Muslims in the audience? I'm not actually, I shouldn't raise my hand. I'm a, I'm an Orthodox Christian. Um, <laughs> Okay, so you know zakat. This is charity that Muslim people give. It is an obligation. Zakat last year, according to the Islamic Development Bank, raised $600 billion. If we take 1% of zakat to channel it to the people in that country, it would bring the gap almost by half down. And it is possible. We also want to see more responsibility from countries that are getting richer. More wealth, more responsibility. We are proposing as a panel to develop an index, we call it the responsibility index, that traces increase in income per capita and giving for development and humanitarian aid for the whole world to see. And I would say that there are many wealthy old economies that might find themselves a little embarrassed by the curves on this graph. We also want to see more financial innovation. If we can create financial instruments to make this economy be 75 trillion, we should be able to tap into that innovation, uh, for example, by, by looking at 
large volume high transaction, large volume activities like sports and entertainment by bringing uh, in this field the Google and the Facebook of this world with a tiny, teeny percentage of what goes through their pipelines, we can feed and educate and house and treat and protect the people in that country. And we also want to see how we can get individual giving to be more predictable. Because we as people, are, we, we, we actually are very often very generous, but we have one little problem to solve. Our generosity is usually driven by, by what we see in the six o'clock news or on the front pages of newspapers. Well, wonderful, but 90% of people who, 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 who need help are in silent tragedies. They are not on the six o'clock news. These are the Central African republics of this world, forgotten. And for this forgotten crisis, we have to find a way to channel your empathy, your goodness to that cause. So we have a lot of work to do in this panel. We are, we are hoping to complete our report in the beginning of December. And we hope to then take it on the road and make it bite, make it work. And we think this is so very important because it is morally right, but also because it is in our self-interest. Trouble travels, as we can see it in Europe now every day. In the month of October alone, there were 218,000 refugees, migrants, coming to Europe seeking protection and better life opportunities. We also need it because in the world we live in, we just don't know what the future would bring. Some decades ago, we were the refugees. In 51, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugee Office was established for us, for the Europeans displaced by the Second World War. Who is to tell that it wouldn't be us someday in the future? Building solidarity among us in our family of nations is the only way we can brace for and face a more fragile world that inevitably lies ahead of us. So how many of you believe that solidarity is absolutely paramount? Raise your hand. All the power to you. <laughs> Thank you. Two ladies on both sides. Oh, I like that. That's, that's right. Thank you both uh, for setting the stage for us, for, for reminding us both about the, the absolute essentialness of the UN and the challenges as we move ahead. And you've both invoked um, the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll ask you a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to the audience so everybody be thinking if you want to come in on the conversation and ask some questions. But, um, you know, there's, there's a wonderful saying that says, never waste a crisis. And it, 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 as I think we've both all, all discussed, the 60 million who are displaced right now, only a teeny fraction is actually reaching the shores of Europe and unsettling mm -hmm. Europe to such a great degree. But it is bringing it to our attention. How do we use this moment to help to refocus energy and attention on where the roots are? And how do we um, use this moment to address that arc of conflict and fragility that is you know, through the Middle East and Africa? Well, uh, 
You're right. This is an opportunity, but we are in a hurry. We have to do it very, very soon. From the UN perspective, because we want to remind of the Refugee Convention 51, we want to remind of human rights uh, instruments, we want to remind of the Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We also want to remind of an analysis needing to focus both on the situation of countries of destination, the debate in Europe, countries of uh, transit, Libya, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, Jordan, and countries of origin. I think we are in a quite a bit of a hurry to deal with the origin. Uh, because this will f continue to flow to a tremendous dangerous degree if we have these conflicts continuing. And I think this is probably one of the reasons why there is a little glimmer of hope of a political process starting, hopefully, in, in Syria. I'm not sure, but at least the driving force, as I said in my speech, is very, very strongly there. And also I can give you an example of how important it is to get this, the funding that that Georgieva was, uh, Kristalina was talking about for the uh, operations. I think we are up, we, if we are lucky, we get 40% of the appeals now. That's, that's if we are lucky. But I can give you an example of what it means that we don't have those resources to help, for instance, uh, Lebanon to thrive or to, to take care of this. Uh, you know, every third person in Lebanon is a Syrian today. There was a family leaving Aleppo. It was a Norwegian foreign minister who told me two weeks ago. He was in Baalbek, Lebanon. He interviewed a family there. And the family had left Aleppo, not only because of the bombings in Aleppo, but because of that, the fact that the five children, none of the five children were, was going to school since a year and a half back. Mm -hmm. And they felt so desperate about yep. not ne next generation would have an education. So they fled to Balbec, where they ended up in Lebanon, thinking that their five children would go to school in Balbec. Not a chance. The schools were absolutely overcrowded, like the health clinics and, and not to talk about jobs. So the possibility was that two of the five children might, in a year's time, get into school in Balbec. So what did they do? They took a boat, or whatever you call those vehicles, bringing them over to Greece, and then they were on the road to Macedonia, up to Serbia, whatever. This is a reality. In other words, the two reasons for the Syria flow is the war in Syria and the fact that we cannot provide decent life and not help the Lebanese, you know, with the infrastructure need to do the job. But I think we should, we, we definitely now have to organize this in a, in a more structured way and I think we will, be, we will have a meeting on financing on, for Syria in February. I am in contact with the key people in the uh, refugee community and, and our uh, different organizations, including IOM, or international migration to uh, see whether there is a need also for an international approach because this is a problem not only for Syria and the Eastern European, the, the route is there now. In next week, I'm going there by the way to Malta, there's a meeting about the African flow from mm -hmm. Sahel, Eritrea up to Libya and then up to via Italy mainly and Spain to, uh, and Malta to Europe. And then there is uh, the uh, situation around Myanmar with the Rohingyas. Mm -hmm. And we have also in Central America, of course, the flow from Mexico, through, from Central Africa through Mexico, US. So we need to take this as an opportunity to really mobilize on finding a way to have institutions, apropos institutions important as goal 16, work in this new area, this new important area of the new global landscape. Oh dear. And Kristen, you have a really unique vantage point as both yeah. a European yeah. commissioner back and, and your role as the high-level panel chair. Um, I will start with the following. Coming from the uh, humanitarian field, being a humanitarian commissioner, I put forward uh, my first draft budget for 2016. And I'm a very big believer in focusing on limited number of top priorities. So the three priorities of our budget were where there were significant increases were competitiveness, jobs and growth, especially for young people in Europe. Secondly, migration, being prepared for what I knew from my previous job was going to come. Uh, the, the, the slow tsunami of refugees uh, uh, pushed by the Syrian crisis. And three, four, external action. And there we proposed 28.5% increase, the biggest ever proposed. What happened in March when the refugees were still not such a visible threat? Uh, 
we got fairly good reception of the first, more money for, for jobs and growth. Uh, lukewarm, but still acceptance for migration, and not much of acceptance for external action. I'm going back next week for our budget, our final budget negotiations, and we increased this significantly. We actually got from 4.5 billion euros in 2015, in the beginning of 2015, for dealing with the refugee crisis to almost 10 billion now. Big chunk of that goes for external action. It goes for the neighboring countries. It goes for dealing with the stabilizing these countries. And I believe that the acceptance in Europe is much higher because now it affects us. I'm, you know, I regret to say that is how awareness is being built, but it is now being built. And the question is what we make out of this as an opportunity. First, it is the moment to engage our people in Europe to understand that dealing with the root causes is not humanely much better, but it is also much cheaper. 10 euros spent in helping people to go, uh, kids to go to school, or, you know, it, it is actually around 100, 150 to 200 uh, euros per kid to go to school, the refugee uh, children. But spending this money serves as an anchor for the family, whereas when they come to Europe, the cost is 5, 10, 20 times more, depending on which country in Europe you go to. If you go to the country I come from, Bulgaria, uh, the money that, that are made available, is made available is 150 euros uh, per family. You go to Germany, it is 400 euros plus, uh, plus free lodging. It's a much uh, wealthier country. So that getting people to recognize the value of the uh, problem or the trouble or the, I mean, the visibility of, of what we are talking about in front of you. But that is not good enough because helping people where they are is good. Not having them to flee their homes is even better. Best way to deal with our humanitarian gap is not to have humanitarian crisis in the first place. And that takes us to the tough, tough job of conflict prevention, what you talked about on, on one side. Um, and here is my, my, I mean, I have been beating my head on this question. If I decide to start a conflict in my home country, in Bulgaria, I get people to hate each other, and then they shoot each other, and then you come, mediate a peace, I probably would get a Nobel Prize for peace for stopping the bloodshed. Mm -hmm. The question is how to have a Nobel Prize for peace for not yeah. starting it to begin with. Mm -hmm. How to make prevention visible. Yeah. And that's not an easy, that's not yeah. an easy mm -hmm. task. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to find more creativity, more imagination, maybe have a Nobel Prize for just being good. <laughs> Uh, as uh, I think people want to applaud that, so uh, let's go ahead. I can tell you, I can tell you that all my colleagues here at USIP just gave that an applause as well because that that's that's a key part of our mandate and a part of uh, something we struggle with. And you know, let me just pick up on that because. Um, yeah, and you mentioned the very difficult uh, effort to negotiate the Security Council resolution that uh, was really about some basic provisions uh, to provide humanitarian assistance during yeah. the, the, mm -hmm. the Syrian war and, and to stop the barrel bombing. Yeah. And this was a long and difficult negotiation that essentially did nothing to stop the barrel bombing. Mm -hmm. This is something that, that the UN has struggled with. Mm -hmm. There was an effort to have the responsibility to protect several mm -hmm. years back. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is, as we look ahead, and uh, certainly in the absence of the Nobel Prize that you just recommended, Christina, what, are, what do you see, what are the ways that the, the international community can find additional tools or levers to 
get in front of the terrible atrocities and the terrible ways that that states abuse their own people. Well, I'm, I'm on the same uh, same idea of prevention. Uh, my my line on prevention is: uh, Did you ever see a headline in the press, uh, first page or first news? The disaster did not occur. <laughs> <laughs> Or you go to a politician, and I was one myself, and you talk about something beyond your own mandate period, you have to do something now, it's because glassy eye, glassy eye is coming. We, when I asked about UN reform, I say there are two things we need. One is to introduce a, an absolutely concrete culture of prevention. And the second one is to learn that in today's world we have to go horizontal. We have to get away from the curse of the silos and see how we go across uh, in order to reach results. So I think these are the two most important things to do, to, 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 to do prevention. And I gave you one example, although I rushed it in the end of, because I talked too long over there. But I, I, I have this, we are pushing this idea of human rights violations. Why don't we act on the human rights violation stage instead of waiting for the atrocities? Mm. Yeah. And if we get an acceptance of member states for that, so that they can understand that it is in order, it is their only life and self-interest to, to go along with it, that's fine. We did a few things. We opened the gates in South Sudan when Nuers and Dinkas were about to massacre each other in tens of thousands. We opened all our gates to bring them in. Yeah. That was a late action prevention, but it, I'm not too proud of that because it was just a crisis situation. Central African Republic, I'm more satisfied with because I had Rwanda in my eyes and said, listen, never, never, never again. So instead of leaving at that dangerous stage, we had, there was, you know, the African Union troops. We were on the phone, Secretary General and I, to 25 governments to ask them to come there. The, the yeah. French were there in good yep. force and the Europeans yep. came. You were in another discussion. And in the end, we had a big increase of presence. It was bad enough in Central Africa Republic. It's still bad, by the way. But it, we did the contrary to Rwanda. But what I'm most proud of is that even the Nigerians now accept that we did a pretty good job on, in the Nigeria, worst case scenario. After the elections, you could have seen Nigeria yep. go into a huge yep. crisis. And we, had, we did a lot of things in the spirit of human rights up front, including dialogue with the president who resigned in the end, other political leaders, discussions in the, the spirit. And, I'm allowed now to say this in front of you. The reason I think this is important, and Lynn Pasco is there, you know what I talk about. For them to, to, to send the message that they find it legitimate for the UN to interfere, as some would say, in their internal affairs, is a qualitative step forward. But the Nigerians now say, we are grateful, we listened, and look, they, Nigeria is on its way to, to another reality. So we, if you could help us, and I look at particularly younger people, try to translate a prevention to a concrete action plan. And I know Melanie and her colleagues are doing a great job on this. And I think uh, your Alliance of Peace Building is, is also, should also have a little subtitle, Alliance of Prevention, which mm. you still have <laughs> in your mind, I know. I mean, I, I have two points to make here. Uh, one is uh, responsibility to protect. One of the big achievements of the United Nations is to get everybody to agree that we as community have responsibility to protect people, including from their own governments. It is well thought true, but in the last years we see less discussion on responsibility to protect. And of course, there is a reason for that, because in the minds of many, responsibility to protect is only associated with military action, protect via military means. But it need not be just by military means. And I have a very strong a sense that we ought to use discussions to bring that back and think of the variety of ways in which we can act to protect people from undue harm. My second comment is 
we have to actually uh, work with the media on prevention. It would be wonderful, and maybe you can uh, launch something in that direction through the uh, uh, US Institute of Peace, to get media partners and bring creativity on making the disaster did not happen interesting enough to be on the first page. How do how we do it? I think there is actually value of bringing, making it a competitive process. Uh, I'll tell you my, my, my story. Uh, you probably know it uh, uh, because uh, we probably have been traveling together at that time. Uh, we had a um, very serious drought coming in the Sahel and we can see it. We can see that it will be devastating. It was uh, 2011 and then Early, we all united to provide assistance to people before the drought is to hit. So we prevent tragedies. And I'm there in February, and a journalist, well, I said BBC journalist, interviews me. Has the cover up, says, Commissioner, how are you going to guarantee I will not be here in June to film starving children? And I said, because I'm here in February, this is my guarantee. <laughs> and then I ask him, and how would you guarantee that if there are no starving children in June, you will come? <laughs> he was not there. <laughs> and I, and I, I, am, I am struggling with that because we, we all understand that we have to make prevention, including to, you know, prevention to, nat to, to death from natural, natural disasters or conflict, we have to make it sexier, but how to do that? And you know, again, I'm thinking of, of creating some kind of incentive to, to make the best prevention story on television or something, I mean, to get yeah, that moving. We've noted the challenge, my yeah, USIP yeah, yeah. colleagues and I. Um, a final question before we open it up, and that is, um, you know, how wonderful it is that we're all talking about Goal 16 and that, that actually got included through some very tough negotiations um, and that so many people know what Goal 16 is. How do we make it real? How do we, what do you see as the, as the opportunities to, to really push that forward? Because that's the heartbeat. That's the heartbeat of how to make progress on a, on a whole constellation of issues. And it won't be easy. Mm. What, what are the first steps? I'm encouraged that there has never been more discussion about so-called implementation than on these SDGs. I'm asked, what are, well, how is the UN system ready now? What do we do 1st of January? Is ECOSOC High Level Political Forum going to be the uh, member states' uh, body watching over this? I say, we have now set the direction here, but we now have to make sure that this moves to the national level above all. The nation state need to take this over, make it part of the national planning, including number, number 16, of course, but it goes beyond governments. It requires, for instance, that parliaments now see that these goals are not affecting only development of foreign ministries' work side. It's energy, it's transportation, it's agriculture, it's environment, it's finance. Mm -hmm. So parliamentary committees have to see that there's no longer any line, sharp line between international and national. You need to involve the, the, the private sector, the enormous uh, capacity that come from technology, from creating jobs, from innovations uh, to deal with the situations in the health sector. And, and uh, then, of course, the civil society and organizations like your own. Uh, nobody can do everything, but everybody could, could do something. If this, these goals also could serve as a mobilization of good forces, mm -hmm. uh, then I think then they are doing their, their job. So it's just that UN, yes, we have done this, and I really commend the member states. I'm impressed by the member states coming to this conclusion. But I think it has to be permeating, and nobody escapes responsibility. That, that is, I think, the, the main message. You know, I, I, um, I think the um, most important thing about Goal 16 is that it brings uh, front and center the importance of uh, rule of law and institutions. And uh, you talked about it, that Sweden is rich because it has roads and schools and rule of law. Uh, I remember going to Haiti after the earthquake and so we traveled around, and I said to myself, the, I mean, the earthquake was horrible, but as horrible it was, 
It wasn't Haiti's biggest problem. Haiti's biggest problem then and now is what? Papa dog, baby dog, all the terrible governance of the country yeah. that actually mm -hmm. deprives people from, from opportunities. Mm -hmm. I remember being in the car with uh, our, our office uh, driver and I mm -hmm. uh, asked him, what advice would you, would you give me, how we can help best? He says, don't give any money to the government. <laughs> And then, three years later, we went for the, uh, for the uh, third anniversary uh, with uh, David Sharok. He's here in the room. David Sharok is in taxi, uh, going to the airport in New York. The taxi driver happens to be Haitian. So he asked him, you know, we are going to Haiti. What is your advice? Taxi driver says, don't give any money to the government. <laughs> unless, we, unless we actually recognize that goal 16 is about peace and security, but they ain't gonna happen unless we build the institutions, mm. the respect for the rule of law across the board, as tough as this is. Uh, and I think what we need is really looking at very seriously at the indicators, the, the capacity for us to, to, to measure progress, and then to have the bravery to speak <coughs> truth to power. When you don't have it, we say it. <coughs> Amen to that. <laughs> so, I, I want to go to uh, my partners uh, in hosting this event for the right of first refusal on any questions. It's on. No? So, if you do think of it, um, there, there, Others in the audience who would like to comment, let's start over here. And then why don't you give the... No, done here. Go ahead. I'm going to take three questions, Perfect. comments. So we're, we're here to celebrate the 70th birthday of, of the UN, and you've talked a lot about this generational change and what it means for, for youth people to be more involved, but also what it means to recognize the mistakes of the past and, and to look at the at legacy, but also to, to look forward. And I wonder, in that, how do you see that same philosophy applying to a, to a more profound change of the UN as an institution of the UN as the way that things work inside? And, and I'm also, I cannot avoid but to think of the Security Council and the way it works right now. Mm. Okay, uh, and then the amb ambassador to Somalia. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ahmed Awad. I'm the ambassador of uh, Somalia. Uh, I thank uh, USIP for inviting me to this wonderful uh, evening. Uh, the two presentations remarks by Christina and by uh, Jan were, were inspiring, but I was, uh, uh, I was moved also by their passion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, uh, Mr. Jan, I, I second your prescription for development, uh, what made uh, Sweden get to where it is. Uh, if I remember very well and I didn't take note, uh, infrastructure, education, and strong institutions. Mm. And, uh, and I'll, I'll ask you a question about what the, what the UN could do uh, about Somalia in that regard. I mean, Somalis may not be able to do for themselves what the Swedish did, but the question is what can the UN do in those three areas. And I also uh, subscribe to the, uh, what was the, uh, the headline of the papers? Uh, no disaster uh, happened. And Somalia is an example. Somalia is characterized in the minds of many people mm. by three images. Uh, black black uh, hawk down, piracy, and, and, and terrorism or Shabab. But Somalis, and thanks to the UN play, Somalia has been without a uh, state for 24 years, more than 24 years. But the Somali people, with their resilience, mm -hmm. have survived 
these 25 years. Of course, with the help of many people, including the, the UN, the European Union, and all of that. I work it for the UN, by the way, in peace building in Sudan. In Darfur, uh, yeah, and after you left, I've been there. Oh, yeah. So in 10 years, I work in peace building. So I can relate to these uh, institutions. But the, the point I'm making is that uh, the, the, the good stories that could be written about Somalia overwhelm the bad things that are happening in Somalia. Many parts of Somalia, Somalis are, are, are resilient people, uh, very entrepreneurial. We lead in, in, the, in many parts of the region in, uh, in, uh, in you know, ventures in IT and, and all of that. So perhaps we should start uh, for people to get Nobel uh, Prizes by reporting on the, uh, the good things, the positive mm -hmm. things that are yep. happening yep. In, in, in Somalia, and that could be uh, reinforced. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ambassador. Yep. And we'll take one more from the young woman who we took the microphone from. <laughs> young woman. Oh. <laughs> well, can okay. I have okay. this Okay, go one? ahead, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll take four. Go ahead. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, my name is uh, Rabin Pasha, I'm an Iraqi Kurdish refugee, and uh, I wanted to thank you, or I was an Iraqi Kurdish refugee, and I ended up working in development. I wanted to thank all three of you for bringing us to where we are today with a seven-year anniversary, and especially Ambassador Eliasson. I remember your work because I grew up in the Iran-Iraq war, right. and in uh, 1988, and finally bringing that to a closure. A decade later, unfortunately, I was a refugee coming to the U.S., but a decade after that, I worked in the United Nations, and I was a part of writing the UNDAF. Um, I want us to maybe actually bring the other two questions together and the youth and the entrepreneurship I want to pick up on that because I think that's really critical and uh, USIP has also done some great work in, in this regard but as I look forward to 30 years from now and hopefully most of us being able to celebrate the hundred year of the United Nation I am deeply and gravely concerned by the generation right now that is growing up in these states and especially the young people who have been failed by their states, yeah. by their public system, engaging them in governance, and by what they grow up to, which is a public system of employment, which is really uh, deeply driving the financial issues and bringing a lot of despair to people, driving people to extremism, driving people to migration, all of those things. How can we build upon the hope and in creative areas, and I'd love to hear from you in the business sectors and making the case and with youth and entrepreneurship as a way of driving hope. Because I, I deeply believe that hope is contagious, despair is not contagious, but the problem is that messages that fill the void and build on despair are very much like gasoline, and that's what's happening. And as you, Nancy, have very eloquently have talked about this arc, you know, this arc has almost 70% of its population is under 30. These are the people who will be celebrating 100 years. How can we address them now, right. concretely? Thanks. Thank you. And then final comment Thank you. on this round. Um, my name is Lou Jane, and I am a biomedical engineering student at the George Washington University, so very close. Um, thank you so much for coming. And my question is, uh, so when the beginning of demand for Syrian refugees came, many of us were happy that countries like Germany and Turkey were accepting large numbers. But we were disappointed and very surprised when many of the neighboring Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, who are very wealthy, were not even willing to take one Syrian refugee. So my question is, what were your expect, um, you know, uh, hopes basically for these wealthy Gulf countries to accept Syrian refugees? And most important question is, what can the international community do to put these countries in have them do their responsible part and actually take charge. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So you want to start? who wants to start? <laughs> Kristalina? OK, well, I'll start um, um, on the UN uh, system. We have to be demanding from the system because the world demands from it. In other words, it's not a capricious demand for change. In our humanitarian uh, financing panel, we will be making some recommendations for the humanitarian side of the uh, system. But you are, of course, right that there is a lot to be expected from the Security Council because of the enormously important role it has 
in anticipating trouble, preventing uh, conflicts, uh, being decisive when conflicts uh, take place, uniting the membership. Uh, and let's see how, how things would go, but I, there, is, uh, th there is a bit of a hopeful indication now with the sober realization that lack of decisive action has made the uh, Syria uh, crisis a uh, huge danger for all of us. It is a security uh, problem not just for the neighbors, uh, and certainly not just for Syria. Whether or not a specific crisis would unleash the potential for more profound change, we will see. Uh, but that change is a necessity and it's a very healthy thing. Uh, that it's a scary thing too, but it is a healthy thing uh, and that we need the system to, to, say something at the very end. to lean forward uh, and that to, is necessary also for the respect of the citizens of the world towards uh, this uh, system. On the question of how you, what we do about the young people and how we, how we create a more a hopeful uh, future for them. I mean, obviously, number one uh, priority has to be figuring out how to generate more jobs because no jobs, plenty of time on your hands, no hope, not very good things happen. But I also think that there is a, um, a very serious dilemma in messaging why? Because goodness is very quiet. Hate is very loud. How to make the voices of goodness to be amplified? And basically that is on all of, on all, all of us. Speak up, speak up. Um, unless we do, unless we, we have no shame to say, Good, bravo, and encourage the positive things to be, to be, to be spoken about, uh, then we are in trouble. And unfortunately, we are wired as human beings to respond to trouble from the days when we were hiding in our caves from big animals, you know, that we are supposedly hunting, but they hunt us. That is a problem, but, but we have to, we are smart, we can generate more positive. And I would finish with Somalia, my one and only trip to Somalia. We are landing on, it's not a strip, but a piece of, of sort of field, landing there. And I would admit that you're right, we are all full of these uh, uh, prejudices. I see from the, it's a tiny little plane, and I see from the window big Toyota trucks with machine guns on top running towards uh, us. And, I'm, and my reaction is, can we turn this plane and fly out? <laughs> we walk out of the plane, people are welcoming us. They have very little, but they are there to, sh to share it with us. And then we went with them to a place where uh, there was uh, uh, EU-funded um, activities, and we can see how proud people are of themselves in a fair way distributing what we have provided, in a fair way to their communities. So I came back with the story. Um, I tried to tell the story to the media. They were not, from the moment, uh, <clears throat> up to the moment with the machine guns, they were interested. From that moment on, much more difficult to sell. So <coughs> here we are. <laughs> so, well, quickly uh, on uh, reform, UN. I think uh, internally the most important thing is to uh, work horizontally. That we see that, that we will be much more effective in the UN if we also bring in the other uh, parts of the organization that can help achieve our goals. And the SDGs will serve this purpose. Apart from the prevention reform, I think that's the most important thing. Security Council, 
Enlargement of the council, extremely difficult because it requires a veto, uh, a, a, a charter change which they can veto, the permanent members. What I think can be done is a reduction of the use of the veto. Mm -hmm. There is already proposals that veto should not be used in mass atrocity situations. I think one should consider to put the Security Council under pressure to deliver the resolutions. Kofi Annan, Lakta Brahimi, Stefan de Mistura and some of us are paying the price for not having a strong security trans resolution. Mm. If we, they are feeling, if they now at the end of the Cold War, and I hope it is really an end, uh, could come to the conclusion that they should negotiate and come up with a resolution. This is what they are required to do according to uh, the Charter, peace and maintain national peace and security. But they haven't negotiated because they were used during the Cold War to have these notorious vetoes. I say jokingly uh, that the Security Council should work like the Catholic Church when they select popes. They should be locked up and only when the white smoke comes up. <laughs> they have done the resolution. <laughs> it's my reform <laughs> effort. Excellent, <on> <laughs> excellent. <laughs> and then I, I, it's a very serious uh, question about young people. By the way, when I was in Somalia, my, what has made the deepest impression in my whole life, professional life, was being in Somalia 1992-1993. It was the worst I've ever seen. It was the closest that you can get to hell. It was worse than Darfur, worse than anything I've seen later. Mm -hmm. still, I still have these images in front of me. I was back year, last year or two years ago. It's a, an improvement, yes, but you have to still work with basic challenges of peace and security, development, and human rights, and institutions, in a society which doesn't have a tradition of a strong central government. That's one of your main challenges. But also to relate to the very good questions about young people. Seven, as I heard, you may, you may <laughs> confirm this is right, I heard 70% of the population is under the age of 30. But 70% is also the estimated young, youth unemployment rate in Mogadishu. If you add up those figures, even if it's 50 or 60, then you understand what, a dyn what dynamite we have into our societies, not least on the unemployment side. We have to give meaningful lives for people. We have to have a positive narrative, because this negative narrative has so much color, and when people are desperate, they go for these extremist uh, variations. We have to understand that life is a journey where we take steps toward a better future. Doug Hammarskjöld, my mentor, not mentor, but my, my, my great, well, the person who means most for Swedish diplomats, but also you and diplomats, second Secretary General, he had a great way of describing the future. He said the future is two things. The future is the horizon, the vision. If you don't have a horizon and a vision, you can think about Middle East, for instance. If you don't have a horizon, if you don't have a vision for the future, you don't know where to go. But the future is also the step you take tomorrow. Mm. The step to take, you take tomorrow has to be going in the direction of that vision. So you need to understand that, yes, we have a vision, but it's a hell of a job to get there. Thousands of small steps. And we have to do this journey together to build good societies. And that's where Goal 16 come in. Goal 16 simply tells us, you've got to have institutions, you've got to access to justice, you have to understand you have to create peace societies. We must expect from our leaders that they deliver on peace, development, human rights. That's the power of SDG 16. And I'm glad you detected a sort of element of passion in our presentation. I always say that without passion, Nothing happens in life, on any <laughs> level, I was about to say. But without, compa without compassion, the wrong things happen. Passion and compassion, keep that. Yep. <laughs> I, I am deeply sorry that we need to draw to a close, uh, but I want to thank um, our partners this evening, uh, the Alliance for Peace Building, the uh, UN Association of the National Capital Association and the President Woodrow Wilson House. It's wonderful working with you. I want to thank all of you who, for coming. I can tell looking out at the audience that a number of you are deeply engaged with these issues. Thank you for all that you do uh, to keep a 